I said, okay, you guys keep saying all this stuff is real. You keep saying you've got high quality data that you can't show anybody because it's all stovepipe. You hear this word over and over, stovepipe, meaning that each little group is isolated. Like Bob Lazar says, yeah. I, I was only allowed to see this little thing. So I say, okay, am I right that you're telling me that these things are real? Yeah. And then, then they say, and that nobody could do this that we know of? I said, that's right, because they seem to de defy the laws of physics. You hear this phrase over and over, defy yeah. the laws of physics. I say, great. I need to talk to somebody who speaks physics. How do you know they defy physical law? Well, we can see that they do. It's like, okay, if they defy physical law, then there should be a physicist to tell me that they defy physical law. Who's seen the data? Maybe he can't release it to me or she, but tell me somebody who speaks tensor analysis. So tell me somebody who knows what the Dirac equation is, like a pretty low bar for a physicist. There is no one. And I don't quite mean no one, but do you know who Eric W. Davis is? No. You ever heard of the Wilson memo? No. Okay. There's something called the Wilson memo where there's a physicist who meets an, a general or an admiral and the general or the admiral is trying to figure out, I think this is at EG and G, um, why is there some program that I'm not allowed to know about? I have the highest clearances. I have a need to know. I'm like, sorry, we can't tell you. He's talking to somebody named Eric W. Davis. Eric W. Davis so far as I can find, is the only person other than maybe Hal Putoff, who I've been able to talk to, who speaks anything of these languages. This is not a particularly famous physicist. Hal Putoff is an electrical engineer, I think PhD in electrical engineering. Eric W. Davis says to me, I said, is, is there nobody out here who speaks physics? This doesn't make any sense. And he says, well, you, Hal, and I are the three most technical people on this. Joe, I'm not even on this. So you know as much about it as anyone, and you're not even involved. And there's only two other people that know <laughs> the science behind and, and, and like one of them is into remote viewing and, oh. and, and was a Scientologist. Um, so I, I'm just, imagine that you take your wife to the symphony, okay? You're going to see Beethoven seventh. And you look at the string section, the brass section's in place and, and the percussion is there. And you look at the string section and it's a bunch of certified public accountants, you know, like, where are the violins? Where are the violas? Like, oh, oh no. Actually, that we, we have reporters for the AP. They're stringers. Like, that's not the same thing. We have string theorists. That's not the same thing. I'm looking for viol Like, this right. is simple. Mm -hmm. I've been on this for three years, and I can't find anybody who speaks this language, which now that is a huge clue. Imagine that you say that we've lost control of our airspace. We're being menaced. Uh, threats to civilian avi aviation, military aviation. They're seeing these things every day. They defy the physical laws, and there are no physicists anywhere to be found. That smells like BS. Or it smells like a pathological level of bureaucratic incompetence. And Marco Rubio and, and Kirsten Gildebrand, if you're out there, um, at, can you please find out why there are no technically competent people on an area, on an area of national security? And please don't mumble the word stovepipe or need to know or sources and methods. I mean, we had a Manhattan Project. We staffed it with physicists. You have a physics problem. If these things are here, Joe, they are here from so far out of town or they are co-mingling with us on earth. I can't tell you which. There are some reports that these things come screaming in from behind our satellites that are trained at earth along non-ballistic trajectories. I have no idea how to say this. I'm, I'm talking all the time to Avi Loeb uh, with the Galileo project, trying to help him out. He needs funding and he needs some ability to, you know, just if the government won't play ball, he's gonna put out his own sensors in places like Catalina Island, blanket the world, and he'll be able to say, we're seeing these things or we're not seeing these things. But right now we have a puzzle that our government won't release information to its own scientific community. And it reminds me of, you, you probably know airplane movie. Yeah. Well, there's this point, <laughs> well, there's this point where they're trying to land this airplane with these people who aren't pilots. And he says, turn on, the, turn on the landing strip lights. And it was Lloyd Bridges or something. He says, no, that's just what they'll be expecting. Like he's trying to sabotage the people who are trying to land the plane. It doesn't make any sense. We're sabotaging our own scientists. Do you think this is because there's a level of secrecy that's attached to this technology and they've compartmentalized themselves to death and they've gotten themselves to a point where they don't know how to proceed further because they're preventing people from sharing information, which is one of the most important things about science, Right, is that scientists get to share information and all work together to try to figure out what the problem right. is. Is that a reasonable? Well, here comes the decision trees. Like, I wish I could say, yeah, that's what I think right, it is. but it might not be. So one possibility is, let's be honest, if you are faking UFOs, 
The last people you want are the world's most brilliant physicists. You give them the data, they're gonna say, right. oh, look, <laughs> I see what you did. You put a couple of flashlights with lasers into the sky and you can move them really quickly by the angle and that creates the illusion that something is zipping through the world, mm. right? If you are faking UFOs, if you're faking a UFO gasm, the last thing you want is theoretical physicists on the case. Mm. So that would be one reason to clear them out. Another reason would be bureaucracy. You've got these rival groups, they're all starved for money. Nobody wants to invite somebody smarter than they are. So the problem with a B level and C level players is that they're looking for DNF players so that they're not threatened. That's another possibility. A different possibility is that we do have a Manhattan Project and we don't know about it. So for example, we have a Manhattan Project for decoding cryptographic messages and it's called the National Security uh, Agency, NSA. And it used to be called no such agency because we wanted to deny its existence. But now we know it's got a giant building. How do you know that it exists if nobody told you? Well, you'd look at the number of number theory PhDs and people who specialize in things like elliptic curves, and you would notice that a giant number of them after their PhDs disappear. And you'd track to see, well, where do those people live? Where do those names live? Oh, they live in Virginia. Okay. So you'd start to get an idea. Now, in the case of UFOs, if there was an anti-gravity project, which is, I hate, it's like, it's painful for me to even say these words. Really what it would be is a post-Einsteinian physics project. If you had a post-Einsteinian physics project, you would want three subspecialties for sure. That would be differential geometry, which is the basis for um, originally uh, general relativity. In 1976, 75, two guys named C.N. Yang and Jim Simons, who Jim Simons becomes the world's greatest hedge fund manager, um, figure out that quantum field theory is also based on geometry but it's a different version of differential geometry. So that's one specialty that you would want. Second specialty that you would want would be particle theory or high energy physics, however you wanna say that. The third specialty you'd want is general relativity. So if you wanted to detect whether we had a secret Manhattan project, but it wasn't identifiable by a building because we didn't announce its existence, you'd say, is there anything that eats those three specialties? Unless you believe that there's a secret university system because we have lists of everybody who gets produced with a PhD in these fields. If that was the case, the two places that you would have a secret place would be Austin, which is the successor to the Institute for Field Physics at the University of Texas Austin Gravitational Group, General Relativistic Group, which has had John Archibald Wheeler Steven Weinberg, Bryce DeWitt. This is a powerhouse of a place that you happen to live in and you should have these people who are the, the successors to these people on because most of these people have died. But the more spectacular place would be Satucket, Long Island. The State University of New York at Stony Brook has an astounding collection of monster minds. And it's not highly regarded as a university. I mean, it's, it's, it's strong, but you would have no idea how strong this place is. It's got multiple fields medalists. It's got an institute called the, uh, what is it? The Center for Geometry, Simon Center for Geometry and Physics. C.N. Yang, who's ar arguably the greatest living theoretical physicist, uh, is at this university. He's 101 years old, so he's, he's pretty much on his way out, but this is where he's called home. And it's not advertised as the powerhouse that it is. So shout out to the State University of New York at Stony Brook. If I was gonna locate a Manhattan Project in plain sight uh, and get US News and World this is a minor player in, uh, in research, that's where I'd go. But more importantly, and this is the really weird thing, and again, I don't wanna spread this as a rumor, but I am saying if you wanted to imagine that there was, that the government wasn't incompetent and we actually had great people on this project, my friend and advisor who's now died, Isidore Singer, once said to me, he said, the world's greatest mathematics and physics department is Renaissance Technologies. And I said, what? Didn't make any sense to me. It's great people, but it's a hedge fund. Okay, so you've got this weird thing where you've got three basic uh, institutions that are very closely intertwined. You've got Brookhaven National Laboratory. You've got State University of New York at Stony Brook, a mid-level university with an out-of-this-world math and physics program. And you've got a hedge fund that makes more money than anybody can possibly imagine. Like, there is no, there, there used to be four fortunes in hedge funds that didn't make any sense. Um, one was D.E. Shaw, 
One was Bernie Madoff, one was Jeff Epstein, and one was Renaissance Technologies. Whoa. And I guessed that Bernie Madoff was front, had a legitimate business and an illegitimate business, and he was front-running the legitimate business with his illegitimate business. So he was effectively stealing from his own clients in two separate divi- in, in one division. One, one was the theft, one was the dupes. I got that wrong. He was just running a Ponzi scheme, so shame on me. But I was giving talks about, you know, there's BlackRock uh, and 